I shut everything, I shut everything out. It's for two hours, it's escape. It's where, now at Sierra Vista Mall, I really don't care if it's a good movie. Because the lounge chairs, man, I, I just go to sleep then. So it's, it's been an escape. <clears throat> and some people say they go to church for the very same reason. And I don't want that to be the reason you come to church. This is not an escape. This is reality. The kind of, the kind of things that Tim was just talking about in that song there. Christ's love is greater. Christ's love is stronger. Christ's love awakens me to the reality of who he is in spite of the circumstances going on around me. I don't come here for escape. I come here for a reality check because often the adventure of life and the frustrations of the world corrupt our thinking in a way that makes things so muddled and confusing. And here is a fresh dose of, of, of what over the long haul, I'm not seeing just the moment. And we, we live in a time and a culture that can only live in the moment, and we don't see a bigger picture. And that's the reason for the sermon series we're in. What's up with heaven is because that's the big picture. Three of the last six memorial services in the last 12 days here, our own church family, and I'm rejoicing. And I've watched their families rejoice. Because though there is a momentary absence, there is an eternal hope. I just read this quote, I hope I can get it right, this past week. Those who face life without Christ have a hopeless end. And those who face death with Christ have an endless hope. That is good. Sunday mornings, the times we come together as a church family is for the purpose of clearing out the debris of, of a hopeless end. Draw us back to the attention of the big picture. We have an endless hope. Well, there's no charge for that sermon today. <laughs> <clears throat> so, thank you. So, it's good to have you here. We don't, uh, we don't have the movie stars on the screen today for announcements. You're, you're stuck with me today, all right? Uh, so, welcome. It's great to have you at New Hope. If this is your first time uh, to visit New Hope, you honor us by being a guest today. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill one out. Drop it in the offering bag when it comes by a little later. Let us know of your presence. We make some promises. We will not bother you on the phone. We will not beat on your door. All we're going to do is send you something in the mail. It literally is going to show up in your mailbox, in your home mailbox. Yeah, slow mail, because you got an email box at home, all right? So, so the terminology today, you've got to be so definitive. It's going to actually come, all right, with a stamp on it. Uh, and it's going to just simply let you know the kind of opportunities that are available at New Hope, what we have for kids, what we have for adults, what we have for young adults, what we have for senior adults. It'll list everything, hopefully answer most of your questions. And apart from that, we're not going to annoy you uh, in any possible way. Uh, so we'd love for you to fill that out. Those same cards are also for our regular church family. If you have messages to the staff, if you have updates on prayer requests, new prayer requests, uh, praise items, please indicate those. Our staff meets every Tuesday morning. We go over these. We pray for all those prayer requests. And if we need to do any follow-up uh, that you've asked from us, we do our best to get that done within a week or two. So please, uh, please fill those out if you would. Um, this coming Wednesday uh, is going to be, summer's kind of light around here on our Wednesday night activities, but our kids and young families are going to be meeting here from 5.30 to 8 o'clock. You don't have to show up right at 5.30. If you don't get off till then, grab your kids, come on down. Dinner will be here at the church, all right, for all of you. Uh, it's going to be hot dogs and hamburgers and uh, chips probably, maybe even some potato salad, I don't know, but uh, they'll have lots of stuff for you to eat, and it's water slide night. It's water night for all the kids. So if you have have kids from, uh, you know, uh, preschool through sixth grade, bring them on down. The weather is certainly right for a water night. I went to Bass Lake yesterday evening for a, well, yesterday afternoon for a wedding. No shade. It's why, I'm sorry guys, if you all have cabins at Bass Lake, it's why I don't like Bass Lake. It was just as hot at Bass Lake as it was here. Holy smokes, I was in a suit and a tie and I was sweating. Uh, but 
If you're sweating Wednesday night, come here and play in the water, all right? I think they'll even let the adults slip and slide a little bit if you want to. Uh, Love and Respect Bible Study. This is a study on marriage. It's going to kick off this Tuesday night. meets right here at New Hope. Jeff and Cindy Eitzem are going to be facilitating that study. It's a 10-week study. goes from 6 to 8 every Tuesday evening. Uh, The fireworks booth is up. You probably saw it out there as you drove in, but it is not functional yet. It will become functional on Saturday. That is our primary fundraiser to get our high school kids to camp and reduce the cost for them. We've, uh, we've helped reduce the cost significantly for our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, for our junior high kids. This is the last one. This is for our high school kids going to Hume in August. So even if you don't want to buy any fireworks when the stand is open, just drop by and give them a donation. But uh, certainly if you've got fireworks to buy, uh, buy them there if you would, please. Uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up July the 9th through the 12th. If you have kids to register or grandkids to register, please go online and do that by this coming Friday. They've got to get the t-shirt order in, so to guarantee that your kids will have t-shirts by the time uh, VBS starts, please get those, uh, those registrations in. If you don't know how to register online, call the office. They'll walk you through it, all right? Uh, <clears throat> For our VBS this year, it's going to be the most unique and creative we've ever had. Uh, I always call him Dr. J, but it's actually Mr. J, isn't it? Mr. J has been the keynote speaker for Heartland Camp, which is our fourth, fifth, and sixth grade camp, for over five years. Our fourth and fifth and sixth graders love that guy. Uh, He brings a whole stage set up to camp. He's got four or five uh, junior high kids who are his support cast and teaching the lessons and the message and doing the music, which is very active. It's very fourth, fifth, and sixth grade driven. And uh, he is going to be doing our vacation Bible school. He is bringing his set. He's bringing his kids. It is going to be, we still need our volunteers. And speaking of VBS, The supplies list is out. It's online, but it's also here for you today. And if you can help by bringing any of those things, put your name there, put a contact number or email, and uh, this needs to be here. You can bring it to the office office and drop it off before the week of July 9th, okay? So if you can help out with any of those supplies, that would be wonderful. But because Mr. J and his staff of uh, junior hires are going to be here for a week doing VBS, we need some host families. And uh, some of the information is in here, but you can call Mark or Jennifer tomorrow, and uh, they'll give you more information if you could uh, provide a bedroom, all right, for, uh, for two of them while they are here, all right? Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Updates on some prayer requests. Mark Mims, which is Jennifer Addis's uncle, one of my classmates in high school, he is up in Stanford. He received uh, last week a, um, uh, a stem cell transplant. Irma? Tell me the name of what you and him are both fighting. Multiple myeloma. For some reason, that, cannot, that does not stick in my brain, all right? But multiple, multiple myeloma is what both he and Irma uh, are challenged with. He is going through his recovery from receiving those stem cells. He'll be up there for a little while longer. Irma's going up next month. Is my a- information accurate? Okay, so in in August there will be a date set, and she will be going up for the very same thing. And so uh, they're going to be getting together and swapping notes, I understand, so that's that's good. Uh, So please be praying for Mark as he goes through this, and Irma as she will in the future. Uh, One of the newer ladies in our congregation over this past year is Joyce, and am I going to say, Casseroli? Am I saying that name right? Just like Casserole with an, yeah, I on the end of it. All right. Uh, She had a minor stroke this past week. Minor in that there is no evidence of it that you could notice if you saw her or if you spoke with her. And she is home. Uh, Shelly saw her on Friday, and some of her friends just informed me that they called and didn't expect her to answer the phone. And she did, and uh, she probably would have been here today if it wasn't so hot, and they've told her to take it easy for a few days. So continue to pray for her and her recovery. Uh, Earl Rowland uh, from our church uh, has had three strokes uh, they didn't know about the first two until this third one uh, put him in the hospital this week. Again, his very similar to Joyce's. If you look at him and you talk to him, there is not a lot of evidence. It was, uh, he became very lethargic, very quiet, almost non-responsive, so she took him to the hospital. Uh, they ran the tests, they did a little bit of treatment, and then they released him. So he is home today, but again, due to the heat, is not out. And then when you all leave today, some of you may run into Jim and Brenda Watson as they enter for the last service today. 
Uh, Jim has been on our board for many years. Uh, Jim and Brenda have been dear friends of mine for about uh, close to 35 years. And uh, they are moving this week to Tennessee. So uh, their youngest son and daughter-in-law and their now two college-age granddaughters live in Tennessee. And uh, they're going to go and be with them for a while. And so uh, I will be praying for them. Let them know. Um, let them know that you're going to miss them. And uh, I know they would appreciate that very, very much. Continue to pray for Pam Gallant as she battles uh, breast cancer. John Miller, uh, as, as you know, he's got leukemia. It's not curable. And basically there's no treatment being done for it at the moment except just for pain relief. So be praying for John as they go through this season of life. Uh, next week we have a service here on Wednesday for Richard Wogamuth. How many of you remember Greenbrier Clothing Store at the Triple J Shopping Center? All right, got, oh yeah, 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 okay, got some guys nodding. You gotta be my age or older just about to remember it. Uh, that was Richard's store. And actually his bride and, and, and daughter are in the service with us today. And it's great to have them. Many of you, um, if you went to Buchanan High School or your kids did, uh, you know who Mama Bear is. Well, Richard is her stepdad, and so Ricky is with us today. It's so nice to see you all. And you might know Ricky's brother, Kevin Musso. He has the career where you can be half wrong and still have a job. Uh, <laughs> that's just, yeah, yeah, humor. All right. Um, he, terrific, terrific guy. So we'll be, uh, we'll be honoring uh, their dad and, and, and her husband this coming Wednesday. So please be praying for them. They would appreciate it so much. Um, thank you again for being here today. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us while we have our tithes and offering. And would you join with me as we pray? Hmm. Father, there is a, a sentence in the Bible that I'm so glad you made sure was there. And it's this very brief sentence that says, your grace is sufficient for us. Father, there are a lot of times in our lives in which we try to act like that we don't need your grace, that we don't need your loving kindness to be demonstrated towards us. And yet, eventually, we come to the end of ourselves and we discover that we were not adequate for the things that we were facing. We wear out physically. We get weary in our mind and our emotions end up frayed. And it's those moments that if we've ever heard that verse, if we've ever memorized that verse, if we've ever heard a, a, a lesson taught on it or a message preached about it, all of a sudden we say, oh God, I'm so glad that your grace is sufficient for me. You provide for me what I don't deserve. You give to me what I cannot earn. And even if I have thrown your grace back in your face when I admit that I need it, you rush in to supply it. It's how incredible you are. And so, Father, thank you Thank you that there is this wellspring of sufficiency that we can turn to, that we can depend upon, that we can count on, that, that Father rescues us from the troubles of this world. It is because of your grace that Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled, even in the midst of a very troubling, disconcerting world. Your grace enables us to not be troubled in the midst of all the troubles. Father, I think your grace is so incredible that the number one song in the history of the world carries the name grace in its title. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm found because you found me. Thank you. Father, we trust you with the needs that we've talked about during this service, those going through treatment in the hospital, those who were awaiting treatment to come, those who know that treatment will not, will not extend life one moment longer on this world, but they're ready knowing that death is the gateway to eternal life. Thank you for the hope that brings to us. Father, for others going through challenges, whether they may be relational within the family or conflicts on the job, or just the frustrations that come with living in a world that 
has so many challenges. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. Father, I pray for um, Father, I pray for the children at the border. This is not a this really isn't a Republican or Democrat debate. This is a church. We as your body should be available and ready to do what needs to be done. Father, I pray just as we had a representative from World Vision visit us in our 8 o'clock service, I trust that the best of the Christian ministries we have in this country like World Vision and Compassion International and Samaritan's Purse would rally together and say, hey, we don't have to make this about politics. The body of Christ will care for kids. We'll stand in the gap and we'll build a bridge. Father, give us the, the creativity to think through problems like this so that we can tell the rest of the world, no matter what they're facing, your grace is sufficient. Give us wisdom, I pray. Put us in the right places to talk with the right people so that your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Tim. Okay, I got to do something real quick. All right, excuse me. No, you guys can go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you didn't have to wait. That's just been bothering me all service, so I had to get that had to get that out of my system. I forgot to do it. Okay, I feel much better now. Uh Husbands, I got to talk to you just a minute. Do your wives ever buy your clothes for you? Does, okay, okay. My, mine doesn't often, but on occasion. And she bought these jeans about three months ago. I didn't have the heart to tell her I wasn't going to like them. I've just avoided them. And I, I laid out a new shirt I've had. And I said, oh, when I get home, I need to iron that. I don't expect her to iron my clothes for me. All right. But, but she ironed it while I was doing the wedding up at Bass Lake. And next to the shirt she'd freshly ironed for me were these pants freshly. <laughs> now, the reason that I took uh, an immediate dislike to them is because I thought they looked like skinny jeans. Okay? I, here's something I discovered. When I put on skinny jeans, they're not skinny jeans anymore. <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah. So anyway, um, thanks, babe. I love them. That's good. <laughs> we're, uh, we're studying heaven. We've been doing this for a few months now. What's up with heaven? Uh, for those of you who might be new today, we're trying to look at the subject of heaven from every conceivable perspective. In fact, uh, the first two weeks, uh, I passed out pieces of paper. I gave my, my cell phone number out and asked people to send me their questions. And in about sermon number three, I listed all the questions that we had gotten. And little by little, we're, we're sort of knocking those off. Uh, one of the challenges I've discovered is there are times we say some things about heaven in one sermon, but we really didn't cover it thoroughly. We just made passing comments. And so sometimes you will hear a little repetition, all right, from one sermon to the next, because heaven is a rather expansive subject, and we've got lots of questions. And as I shared with those the first couple of weeks, uh, the unfortunate thing is we will not be able to answer all of your questions. And it's not because we may not have time it's because we don't have the answers. There are going to be some things about heaven we will not ultimately know until we get there. Have you ever tried to describe Disneyland to someone who has never been there? 
I don't care how many times you've been, you're going to fall short in your descriptions and your explanation, and that's even after seeing it. So we are faced with the challenge of trying to find answers about a place that none of us has ever seen. We are taking the information that is recorded in Scripture, and we are trying to understand it from the best way we can from this side of a place we've never been to. And so today we're going to be looking a little more closely at the question, what will we do in heaven? This will not be an exhaustive treatment of it. I've highlighted a few things in the past, all right? I've just kind of gone through a list of some things. Top of my list was eat. As you'll recall, there are several passages that talk about, you know, food and eating and, you know, feasts that we'll celebrate in, and I'm so glad. No cholesterol issues in any of that stuff, all right? And I don't know if it's because the food won't have it in it or because our bodies will all process everything perfectly, all right? That's what I'm counting on. Because so far, anything in this world that they take all the good stuff out tastes bad. So I'm, I'm really counting on the fact that we'll process things really well. Um, and of course, what we've all discovered is that in order to go to heaven, we have to, yeah. And one of the primary reasons for this series has been my hope, my desire, and my dream that we as a church family and part of this community that we live in can by the way that we face death and the death of our family members, that we can show a side of hope that the world so desperately needs to see. As you know, I've done a lot of hospice work over the years with Heinz Hospice, and one of the, the most rewarding things is to see people who've lived most of their life ignoring Christ and now, even in late stages, choosing to trust Him and see the difference from B.C. to A.C. <laughs> and to see how the fear goes away. But one of the challenges I've noticed as a pastor over the years is that often people inside God's church often would express the same fears, worries, and concerns about their own death and the death of their loved ones as those who have no faith. And so there's a point that those of us as Christians, particularly if we have walked in faith for a long time, we need to grow up. As a child, we were afraid of the boogeyman in the closet. But as we grew up, we learned there was nothing to fear in the closet. As we grow in our faith, we need, I think, to come to a place where we need to understand in Christ there is nothing to fear in death. In fact, death is the entrance to heaven. It's like going to Disneyland. You can't wait to get inside. The only problem with Disneyland is what you have to pay at the entrance to get in. That's where the problem is. But for us who have made the discovery, we've been willing to accept Christ's offer, the price has been paid. It's been paid. The, the door is open wide, and, 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 and the wide door is the valley of the shadow of death. But we get to enter into a place far more grand than where we're leaving. There is a passage that quotes Jesus in Matthew 25, 23. We're in that parable. They say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Those are the words that all of us long to hear when we get to heaven is for, for the Lord or whoever he's designated at the entrance to say, hey, enter in. You are, my, you are my child. Enter in and enter into the joy that I have for you. A lot of people don't have that perspective about heaven. So we're trying to change that over these series of sermons. At a dinner party, Guests were discussing the possibilities of future rewards and punishments after they died. One of the guys at the table, his name was Sam. And that particular night, Sam remained very, very quiet 
as he listened to all the others. And, and this was rather unusual for Sam because Sam was a born talker. If I told you that I was the quiet type, how many of you would believe that? Yeah. The same would be said about this Sam. All right? Um, not wanting for him to feel excluded in the conversation, the hostess turned and looked at Sam and said, hey, we would like to hear what your views are about heaven and hell. And Sam looked at the hostess and said, thank you, but quite frankly, I don't want to express my opinion tonight. This is a subject that my policy is to keep silent. You see, I have friends in both places. And so do you and I. Sam was making light of the subject. Some of you know this Sam, or you know of him, I should say. His name is Samuel Clemens. If you don't know him by his real name, you know him by his writing name, it's Mark Twain. In truth, Mark Twain spoke often about both places, both heaven and hell, often in jest. He used the subject of heaven and hell for a lot of the jokes and humor that he told. One time Twain said, this election that's going on right now makes me think of a story of a man who was dying. And he only had two minutes left to live, so, so he sent for a clergyman and he asked the pastor, where is the best place to go? At that moment, Clemens was undecided about it. And this was not a real good preacher. He, he didn't want to be offensive, so he said to Clemens that each place had its advantages. Heaven for climate and hell for the company. <laughs> Twain's tongue-in-cheek story illustrates a lie that many have embraced about heaven, that it's going to be a place of perpetual boredom populated by boring people. Now let me pause before I jump into the meat of this and just simply say, do you know why people outside of church often think that heaven is going to be boring? It's often because of us. Okay, because let's be honest, I mean, I, I don't, it's none of you. <laughs> but I got to be honest, I know a lot of boring Christians. There's a lot of preachers I don't want to hang out with. All right? Um, I, I, I can't tell you over the years growing up how many times I heard preachers preach on the joy of the Lord. And they looked as pitiful as anybody I have ever seen in my life. We, we talk about places like heaven, and we do so as if it's hell. We talk about, i got to go to church. I can't do that. So no wonder the world has this perspective that, man, if those are the people i got to hang out with, maybe that's not such a great place to go. So you and I, we need to work. See, we're the, aver we're the walking billboards of Christ in heaven. I think we need to reflect accurately, truthfully, what both are like. I think there are three popular myths about God and heaven. How many of you are familiar with the science fiction writer and atheist Isaac Asimov? Does that name ring a bell with anybody? Oh, that's good. You haven't read any of his junk. Um, uh, he was the president of the International Mensa program for many, many years. He was really intellectually very, very brilliant. Um, he once remarked, I don't believe in the afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more, because whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would even be worse. How sad that is. And the sad thing for me, for him, is I'm sure he now regrets that choice. I've been taking late night walks. As you all know, I, I leave next Sunday for the Colorado River. Seven glorious nights going through the Grand Canyon, looking at the stars. Oh, it's going to be so fun. Um, so I've been walking to be in a little better shape. I mean, I, I know they're saying, Tim, you're on, a, you're on a raft. But we do get off the raft and we take short hikes. And 
Um, I, you know, I had to fit into these jeans. Um, <laughs> um, so I've been, I, I, uh, last week I was up to 18,500 steps a day. If y'all haven't figured that out, that's a lot, okay? Um, and so usually, particularly now that the weather's turned, it's, it's, it's you know, 8.39, 9.30 when I take off. And, you know, four hours later, I get home. <laughs> But it, uh, it's, what I've discovered over these last few weeks is that the walks have been more beneficial for my brain than for my body. And that was very obvious when I looked in the mirror. But um, <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things that I thought about last night, knowing that this is the message for today, is if I choose to reject, reject God... We do have to break this down somewhat logically for a moment. If we choose to reject God, whether we like this to be said about us or not, it is true. To reject God is to make myself God. To say that there is no God means I'm the one who's going to call all the shots. I will make all the decisions about my life. It's all about what I want, what I feel, what I believe. Do you think if you live that way, do you think you will have any regrets in life? I mean, if you live selfishly, are there regrets? I, I suspect there will be. So even if you're right, you're going to have some regrets with your life. Now, if you find out as an atheist or one who simply chose to never, ever have a relationship with God, and you find out that the Bible is true about heaven and hell, do you think you'll have some regrets after you die? Yeah, I think so. So let's flip that around. If I choose to live my life in the direction that the Bible says is God's will for my life, if I choose to retain, return hatred with love. If I choose to return bad behavior with kindness, if I choose to extend to others forgiveness and grace for their offenses to me, if I choose to tell the truth rather than lie, if I choose to work rather than steal, if I choose to be faithful to my spouse rather than just to play around. And I find out, well, I really wouldn't find out if there is no God when I die. I would just be food for worms. But if the worms discovered <laughs> that this guy didn't get heaven because there's no such thing, do, do you think I would have regrets about being an honest person, a kind person, a generous person, a, do you think I would die with regrets in my life? I, I probably wouldn't. If I die and I go to heaven, am I going to have regrets? I don't know about you, but to me, that seems to be a really easy choice to make. I can choose this great potential for regrets while I live and great potential for regrets when I die, or I can choose this and I have no regrets when I come to the end of my life, and I will have no regrets with the afterlife. I don't know about you, but, and, and maybe it's because I'm not a Mensa member, but that just seems smart to me. Let's look at myth number one. Myth number one is that God is a cosmic killjoy. Mark Twain might joke that the advantage of heaven is climate and the advantage of hell is company, but really, heaven and hell are no laughing matter. Believe it or not, Many people, just like Isaac Asimov, have made decisions about their eternal destiny based on where they think the real never-ending party is going to occur. These people view God as a perennial party pooper and Satan as the life of the party. Those who've come to that conclusion are convinced that heaven must be as dull as watching paint dry. To all of our house painters, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, 
while hell must be as exhilarating as driving in a NASCAR race. Yet both of those flawed conclusions are based on some basic misunderstandings of both God and Satan. I remembered a story just this week. I, I haven't told the story in probably eight or nine or ten years. Um, it, it's not biblically, theologically correct, but it does illustrate this point of people's misunderstandings about both God and Satan and heaven and hell. Um, it's a story about a politician who got ran over by a big truck and killed instantaneously. He was a high-ranking politician. His soul arrives in heaven and he's met at the gates by St. Peter. And St. Peter says, hey, welcome to heaven. But, but before you settle in, we kind of have a conflict. You see, we don't know what to do with you. It's rare that a high official from the politics shows up in these parts. So we're not quite sure how to, how to handle this. The politician says, no problem, just let me in. Peter says, well, I'd like to, but I got orders from higher up. What we're going to do is we're going to let you spend one day in hell and then one day in heaven, and then you can choose. And the politician spoke up, I've already made up my mind. I want heaven. And Peter said, I I'm sorry, but these are the rules. One day in each, then you choose. Now, that's where it's theologically inaccurate. After death, you don't get the choice. The choice is made now. But this is a joke, so hang with me. I'm sorry about our rules, but that's that. And St. Peter escorts a politician to the elevator. Down he goes. Finally lands at the bottom. The door's open, and he finds himself, to his shock and surprise, in the middle of a beautiful green golf course. In the distance, there is a country club. Out in front are all of his friends he had known on earth and other politicians he had worked with, and everybody's happy, and they're all dressed up in their evening gowns and tuxes. They all run out to greet him. They hug him. They slap him on the back. They reminisce about good times they had, getting rich at other people's expense. They play a friendly game of golf, and then they dine on lobster tail and caviar. Present at the party is Satan. He really is a very friendly guy. He has a good time dancing. He tells really good jokes. They have such a good time that before the politician realizes it, 24 hours is up. Everybody gives him a big hug, waves as he gets on the elevator, and the elevator goes, Ch -ch 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 -ch. and the door opens up in heaven, and St. Peter is standing at the door to greet him. Now it's time to hang out in heaven. 24 hours pass just like that. This politician has never experienced such rest, such quiet, such contentment. Just moving from cloud to cloud, playing the harp. See, it's always in the jokes. Mm. He has a good time. And before he knows it, 24 hours is up and St. Peter pops up in front of him. Well, Peter says, you've spent a day in hell and you've spent another in heaven. What's your choice? Politician rubs his chin for a little bit and then he says, you know, I would have never thought it. I mean, heaven has been pleasant. It's been delightful. But I think I, think I would be better in hell. So St. Peter escorts him to the elevator. Down he goes to hell. This time the elevator doors open, and what he sees is a barren wasteland covered with garbage. All he sees is his friends dressed in tattered clothes, and they're all picking up sticks, and I mean picking up trash with a pickup stick and putting it in a bag over their shoulder. The devil comes over to the politician and lays an arm on his neck and the politician says, Satan, Satan, hold on a minute. I don't understand. Yesterday when I was here, there was a golf course and a country club and lobster and caviar, and we all had a great time. Now there's just this wasteland of sweat and work and toil. My friends look miserable. The devil looks at him and smiles and said, of course. Yesterday we were campaigning for your vote. Today we've got it. <laughs> I'm I'm, I'm not sure the accuracy of it in regards to biblical truth, but it's relatively accurate about politics, I think. But, <laughs> but see, we, we tell stories and jokes like that, and often those stories and jokes become the reality of how we choose to believe. Have you ever been stuck at a dinner party seated next to a, next to a real bore? And, and not your spouse. <laughs> Minutes seem like hours, and you're convinced this evening is never, ever going to end 
Satan is that kind of companion. There's nothing very interesting about him. He's never created one thing in his entire existence. Who would want to be stuck by such a bore? On the other hand, God is not boring. He's exceedingly and eternal, fascinating. Just look at the, the present world he's created for us, places like Yosemite and Montana and the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. Heaven is the place where everything will be eternally good, beautiful, enjoyable, refreshing, fascinating, exciting, because heaven's creator is all of those things. Myth number two is heaven is going to be monotonous. Some people are convinced that no matter how exciting the activities of heaven may be, doing the same thing over and over will become monotonous for all eternity. Somebody's motto is too much of a good thing is boring. But the problem, you see, is not heaven. The problem is us from this world's perspective. One mom used to tell her children whatever they complained of being bored. Any of your children ever do that? I'm bored. Yeah, one mother used to say only boring people get bored. It wasn't that her kids didn't have enough to do. They had a house full of video games and televisions and board games and sports equipment and friends and pets. They just got tired of doing the same thing every day. It is ironic that any child or adult for that matter in this country could play with thousands of dollars worth of video equipment and be more bored with life than a child in Africa who's got two sticks and a rock. And they are so thrilled. You, you throw a soccer ball, you throw a deflated soccer ball out a window on a road in Africa, and it goes nuts. And you can drive by a week later, and they are having the time of their lives with one single soccer ball. The truth is, we can't handle the monotony of life on earth because of our sin nature, I believe. Even if it comes packaged as fun and games, so we assume life in heaven is just monotonous and boring. But monotony doesn't have to be boring. Listen to what G.K. Chesterton wrote. He said, a child kicks his legs rhythmatically through excess, not the absence of life. You remember ever putting your hand over trying to get your kids to stop kicking? They don't do that because they're bored with life. They do that because they're excited about life. Children have abounding vitality because they are in spirit fierce and free. Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. How many of you dads have stood on a counter or by a ledge and had your kids jump into your arms? What do they say as soon as you catch them? Do it again, daddy. Do it again. And they want to say that and do it again. And who gets tired? Who gets bored? Not the kid. Us. Grown-up people are not strong enough to be excited about monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again, son. And every evening, do it again, moon. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For sin has caused us to grow old, and our heavenly Father is younger than we are. The activities of heaven will never become monotonous, even if we do them over and over, because we will no longer inhabit aging bodies that grow tired or live in a sin-infected world that makes life so tedious. In this place called heaven, we will enjoy an excess of life. We'll be like children saying to our Father, do it again, Daddy. Do it again. Myth number three, heaven will be one long church service. I got news for you folks. If I believe that, I might choose hell. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, oh, it must be much like this sermon. It's going on and on. You see, the idea that heaven is an eternal worship service is a relatively persistent one out in the world. A number of years ago, there was a guest preacher who was preaching at another guy's church who said, if you have trouble sitting through a two-hour worship service on earth, you'll be miserable in heaven because all we're going to do for eternity is praise God. I would have yanked that guy off this stage if he had said that here. You see, when people say things like that, they give the impression that heaven's just going to be some big yawn fest. Don't get me wrong, I'm a pastor who loves to sing great songs like Tim led us in today. However, although we were created by God for worship, we're also created by God to do worship. While worshiping God, I think, will be a central activity in heaven, it'll not be our only activity. Just as Christians today can offer praise to God while engaging in other tasks throughout the week, Christians in the new heaven and the new earth will worship God during all of their designated times of whatever the activities are. 
I think there's two primary responsibilities, not two activities only, but I think we have two primary responsibilities in heaven. I'm not going to have time to unpack it this morning, but let me throw them out to you. One is worship, and two is work. Some of you don't want to hear that last one, do you? You're thinking retirement is the way to go. Please understand, retirement is a man-made creation, not a God-made creation. Oh, nothing, nothing wrong with leaving the profession that you earned a paycheck in, but that doesn't mean you sit around and become useless. That doesn't mean you can't, you, all you do is play now. Your life still has value. Your life still has purpose and work. Till God takes us home, we have purpose and work to do right here. And I think there will be work. At, when, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, paradise, did they have a job? Yes, they did. It was the same job that they had after the fall, after sin. What was the difference? It was easy before. It was hard afterwards. Creation fought against its work. Before the fall, when there was no sin influence here, everything they did flourished. Everything they did was exceptional. Now it became very hard. Were they going to be able to have children in the garden before the fall? Yes. God told them to procreate. That was his command to them as husband and wife. And you know what, ladies? You ought to be ticked at Eve over this. You know what? Giving birth to a baby in the garden would have been a piece of cake. In fact, it would have been easier than baking the cake. You know that whole bun in the oven thing? It would have been much easier than now that. But because of the fall, there's pain in childbirth. And I don't know whoever came up with the idea of men being in the delivery room at that moment. <laughs> Must be a result of the fall, because that's when every one of us here, you will never touch me again. <laughs> Let me wrap this up. We will worship, but we will worship in everything that we do. It just won't be organized worship. If we're sitting at a feast, we'll be honoring God with the way in which we feast. If on the new earth we're climbing a new mountain and seeing a new vista that he's given to us, we'll be thanking him the entire hike up the trail. We'll be so grateful for all that God has provided for us to enjoy and to experience that there can't help but be worship in the process. And you know what? I'm just going to break out in song anywhere I want to when I get to heaven because I will be able to sing on key. <laughs> I will sound as good as Kepler when I get to heaven. That is so cool. We will worship, and we will work, and we will not be bored. Do you know you're going to heaven? I mean, do you really know that if you were to die before you got home today, and I don't say that as a scare tactic, I simply say that as reality. These past two weeks, we've done services here from a 46-year-old who went to take a nap and never woke up. Earlier this year, a 19-year-old. Death is certain when we're unsure, but it is certain for all of us. It may catch some of us by surprise and others like Johnny Miller right now. He knows within a window of time his days here are numbered. But death should never catch us unprepared. And God loves us so much he pursues us to our very last breath but he would rather we accept his pursuit with our very first thought of him. Most of you are somewhere in between. You've already had your first thought of God. You've already had your first nudge toward him, but you have resisted. 
And some of you are far closer to your last breath than you are your first thought. Why not simply invite Christ in your life? This has been about heaven, not about the one who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, but he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. If you've never invited him into your life, why not in the quietness of this closing moment, you just say, Lord Jesus, I, 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 I know about you because of Christmas. I know about you because of Easter. I, I know bits and pieces of you, but I, I've never invited you into my life. I'm ready to do that today. Maybe some of you are beginning to nod your head and say, ah, this is why I came today even though I didn't really want to. This may be your divine appointment. No fancy prayer, no special formula. God, I believe in you. I'm ready to trust you. I'm anxious for you to teach me more about who you are. Come into my life. I want to know that if I were to die today, that I'll have no regrets about my eternal home. Let's pray. Father, sometimes I come to the end of a message and I think to myself, did I just waste everybody's time? And it's usually at those moments that you bring flooding back to my attention the verse of Paul as he wrote to, a, to really a pretty corrupt church in Corinth. And he said to the pastor and the people of that church, by the foolishness of preaching. I don't think you believe that preaching is foolish, but an act of one person making public declarations to a group of other people. Can anything good come of that? And yet, the Scripture says, by the foolishness of the declaration of your truth, people will be saved. So it's not up to the ability or capabilities or the talents of the, of the speaker. But, Father, it is up to the power of your word and the choice of the listener. And so, Lord, I simply say thank you for those who at this moment may be making some very important personal choices. I don't need to know about them though I love to hear about them, you know about them. And that's what's important. Thank you for hearing our prayers in the past to invite you into our life. And thank you for hearing the prayers of this moment where others are, are doing business with you right now. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. If you want to use our air conditioning, just stay for another service, all right? Or go to a fine restaurant and use theirs. Uh, church tonight, 5 o'clock, if you want to come back, 5 o'clock.